Television. Welcome back to the D-List. A little longer than a week, I know, but now to discuss my top 10 favorite Spontanea Nation episodes. All this and nothing else when the D-List returns now. Number 10. Episode 32, Storage Room and Backup Hot Dog Stand. Paul chats with noted screenwriter, Angelina Jolie impersonator, and fake community college dean Jim Rash about his best mistake. So it was like this nice accident where you put something up, no one liked what you did. Uh, it was a huge <laughs> mistake to put it in front of an audience at any time. And then someone says, I didn't hate the adoption thing. We got it! <laughs> but naturally, they spend most of the chat talking about television. She was the sheriff of a small she town. Was a she, well, she was the sheriff. She is the sheriff. She's the sheriff. A woman is a sheriff. It's an oh, answer to a question no one asked. <laughs> Then Paul and Jim are joined by Craig Kukowski, Jean Villapeak, and Colleen Smith to share the story of a family of immigrants working at the hot dog stand in a theme park that's going out of business. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I am from Russia, one of the many parts of Russia, but I'm not 100% where any of you are from. Oh, really? Yes. You think your accent is so distinct I, that uh, everyone, uh, everyone can tell where you are uh, from? I, uh, that's why I said that out loud, to, uh, <laughs> to be sure. Jim plays the local millionaire who may tear the family apart or may just be their savior. I'd like you just to type the instructions you read on everything you find in my pantry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh... The print is too small, and so when I'm going through my pantry, I need to have a sort of a, a table of contents. An emotional roller coaster of carnival barkers and tapeworms ensues, leading up to a classic twist ending in the final line of dialogue. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you didn't see that coming. <laughs> Number 9. Episode 11. The Underwear Department at Macy's. Paul asks singer Amy Mann about shameful desires, such as the desire to be universally loved. This chat includes probably one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard for not just dealing with people who don't like you, but really for keeping an empathetic perspective in general. Allow other people to have the dignity of their own experience. But they do acknowledge that's easier said than done. Then Paul is joined by some colleagues from Know You Shut Up. Colleen Smith, Ted Michaels, and Michael Ostrom for a story of a very uncomfortable dad trying to take his daughter Megan underwear shopping. Megan just wants to be popular at school. A school where it's hard to keep even the teachers in line. I've been told you've been having very lengthy heart-to-heart -heart talks with some of the girls. Well, who's to say how long they should be? Yeah, you're right. I'm fine with it. Oh. So she enters the talent show, but faces tough competition. My parents are divorced, and it makes me want to cry. There's a big <laughs> tree in my backyard. I'm going to hang from it till I die. Okay, Timmy, that was <laughs> wonderful. So she and her dad try to make a new life for themselves in New York. The buildings are so tall. I know, taller than either of us, or, or even us standing on each other's shoulders. They look like they could touch the sky, scrape it even. <laughs> But they get into some trouble and find themselves in the New Yorkiest courtroom of all. Put your hand on the Bible and repeat after me. Okay. Hey, what are you gonna do? Hey, what are you gonna do? All right. Oh, and the Macy's burns down due to extreme negligence. Hey, wow. where do you want these oily rags? Um, well, them... Somewhere between the underwear and the open flame. All right, right? I'll just yeah. cram them in there. Uh, maybe I'll spread them around. Hey, everybody, uh, the back door, I uh, nailed it shut. That way no one can escape. Hey, you know what this room's <laughs> missing? A bunch of Irish girls. The whole No You Shut Up gang has terrific comedic chemistry together, and Colleen's extensive knowledge of pop culture often comes in handy in these kinds of stories. You know, it's a popular misconception that he was originally named Leaf and he changed his name to Joaquin. He was actually named Joaquin first because they were in South America at the time. But everybody else had fun names, so he said, can I have a fun name? And they changed it to Leaf. But then he went back to Joaquin later. Let's beat him up. Let's yeah, beat him up. And it's a prime example of a location that sets a story off in motion, but doesn't limit the story. The adventure can go far beyond the walls of Macy's. Does it make anybody else mad when you think it's a BuzzFeed list and it's a BuzzFeed video? You know, like, I can't watch a video out on the subway or on the bus. Me, me. No, no, I see how it is. You don't like your lists in video form. Well, this is awkward. Number eight, episode 23, a Miami record store in 1967. This episode begins with a soliloquy from Paul that asks the really, really deep questions. Now, would Christ drive? I like to think that he would. Who was not in Space Jam that should have been? Why is there no Space Jam with baseball? Then Paul chats with drunk history creator Derek Waters about what constitutes bravery. Coming here is brave. 
I always go to that wrong parking place and I got to reverse and go in the other one. That was pretty brave. There could have been oncoming traffic. Deprivation tanks. Whatever's in that water must be the most toxic thing in the world because they're like, well, if you do get water in your eyes, get out immediately and squirt this water in your ear. <laughs> And drinking. Of course, they talk about drinking. I got a citation when I was 18 for being a witness to beer. I wasn't drinking beer, but I was at a party where I made eye contact with a beer. Then Carla Kukowski, Mark Evan Jackson, and Colleen Smith tell the story of a young girl's journey to womanhood as she shops for records in 1967. Carla's young protagonist character is earnest but naive, wanting to grow up too fast without a concept of what it means, the stuff of classic coming-of-age stories. I, I can't wait to do this heroine stuff with you. It's just like how I've always wanted to be, like a heroine of my own story. And Mark Evan Jackson makes a catchphrase out of a really quite common phrase that somehow becomes funnier every time it's uttered. Make a friend. Our tax dollars are worth. <laughs> well. <laughs> and Colleen graces us with a wonderful rendition of a lost track from an artist we all miss. Plantains Pete walking on sun feet <laughs> making decisions stars are aligned in plantains mind throwing appearances from the Beatles and heroin Harry and you have yourself a juicy time with your tax dollars at work number seven episode 27 underneath the Eiffel Tower Live at Largo, Paul is joined by Chris Tallman and longtime couple first-time scene partners Matt Gorley and Amanda Lund on stage to do some spontaneation. Special shout-out to Chris Tallman telling an absolutely incredible story from his college years. Seriously, it's amazing. <laughs> then Paul talks with the person he spends most of his podcast hours talking to, Scott Ackerman, about what animal he would make from his rib if he could. You can use your rib to make another living thing, but not a human... What do you make? This episode came right after Garden of Eden. Timberly Hill was really fixated on the book of Genesis. Well, if I'm starving, I would make a cow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if I'm horny, I would make a cow. <laughs> Scott basically tries to turn the interview into a game of would you rather. Uh, if it helps, I'll give you some yeah. parameters. Okay. Uh, the, the world is the same and they still sell food at the store. <laughs> In fact, Scott basically tries to be an agent of chaos throughout the entire proceedings. Everybody look upon me as if I am some sort of hardened criminal, but really, I just want love. Why are you in this bakery? <laughs> <laughs> and after countless hours of hearing Paul being the wacky comic character and Scott being the straight man, at least relatively, this is a fun reversal. I like this character, the guy who's annoyed at the things I say. <laughs> <laughs> this, this character. Yep. <laughs> and the story takes us underneath the Eiffel Tower, where a young girl's quest to find herself on the streets of Paris leads to a war between pickpockets. I regret poisoning your wife all those years ago. I regret finding this information out right now. <laughs> An American baker on the loose with a poisoned boot. Are you a pickpocket? Well, if so, look out, because I have a poison boot. I'm not going to tell you which one, because that would be bad advertising. And a surprisingly triumphant and satisfying ending. I was very lucky to be in the live audience for this one, since there's a lot of visual humor going on. So much so that I really wish there was video of this episode. But there's photographs and fan art. Number 6. Episode 14, An Urban Spelunkers Meeting. The always amazing John Hodgman joins Paul to discuss parental adrenaline and the first appearance of Superman, and that's before they even get to the question about naming your car. I've known people who have named their cars. Right. And why do they name them? Like, baby? <laughs> Alan? Yeah, Alan. Mostly Alan. While Hodgman has little to say about his car's name, he and Paul have much to discuss about the leaders of car rental fleets. Admiral the, Marjorie ad Budget. <laughs> oh, no, that's not, that's true. Budget is known for its nepotism. They only, <laughs> they only promote from within the Budget family. The curiosity of other people putting things in your trunk. It was a bag full of hammers and wrenches. <laughs> sure. I, mean, I figured. And the long-storied history of the comic strip Gasoline Alley. The better to enjoy your feeling of impending mortality as you read the funny pages in the morning, as you watch these characters age with you, and then you're like, oh, no thank you. Then Shuli Cowan, Colleen Smith, and Chris Tallman join Paul to share the story of an urban spelunkers meeting gone wrong deep in a subway station. 
This is another story where Chris's knack for monstrous characters comes in handy as he plays a troll named Fasty who may or may not be trustworthy. Well, I used to be an accountant, but now I think of myself as a fictional character living deep in the steam pipes of the city. Colleen also gets a magnificent turn as a monster. I'll let you out when you figure out how to get out. And the whole gang's knack for making the perfect pop culture reference comes in handy in a delightfully pointless tangent about cult classic sci-fi movies. Welcome to this Logan's Run convention. Uh, this is our, our biggest yeah. turnout yet. Hi, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Running Man convention. Boo. Uh, Why are we here? Oh, welcome to the Ice Pirates convention. Which itself is a subtangent within a scathing takedown of school gym class curriculums everywhere. Anyway, we're going to throw balls at kids. Number five. Episode 30, Vent Haven Ventriloquist Museum. Paul chats with living legend and original not ready for primetime player Lorraine Newman about corn or flour, yielding a discussion about dietary concerns, weddings, and other pleasant topics. Then Paul is joined by Mark Evan Jackson, Maria Blasucci, and Shunt McGuppin himself, Jeremy Carter, for a tour of the Vent Haven Ventriloquist Museum. Maria plays a tour guide who may be a bit overly empathetic. I'm sorry, I... I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, we didn't know him, I mean... I'm so yeah. sorry. And she wants to make sure nobody gets hurt, but she has trouble navigating human emotions. Why would you play such a horrible trick on my emotions? Because I was trying to trick you. The tour group seems to be easily confused. Yeah, I got a question. Yeah, go right ahead. This just seems to be a lot of dolls in uh, glass cases. Although in their defense, the museum selection of dummies is rather confusing. So this one here is... Um or Michael Jackson. And the new Whitney Houston uh, ventriloquist dummy is, is all ready. Why don't we start with this John Wayne Gacy puppet? Who's left? Uh, Donald Sutherland. <laughs> Here, here's Charles Manson. <laughs> here's Vivica A. Fox. <laughs> Against my better judgment, here's Osama Bin Laden. But as is usually the case with museums, a supernatural element comes into play, and nobody is sure how to handle it. We, we've reached a, a moral dilemma. Either we let the world know that every puppet and doll has always been alive, or or I guess I live in this museum now. Is it, hold on a second, is it every puppet and doll? I haven't been paying attention. And special shout out to a side story within a side story about the origins of a stiff neck. Now I'm gonna inject you with this, and without having tested it, I have no expectation of the result. Oh doctor, please, I don't think you should. Really? No, no, let the doctor do his work. I got to be able to survive that hanging. <laughs> Number four, episode 12, The Waiting Room at an Oil Change Place. Open Mike Eagle joins Paul to have a delightful chat about the wonderful world of social anxiety, and let me tell you, just about every single piece of this interview was immensely relatable. Like, I wasn't naturally blessed with social skills, mm -hmm. and so uh, part of my life's journey has been about putting those together, right. and typically uh, not having a complete tool set. Right. And then Paul is joined by Hal Lublin and the two JVs, Janet Varney and Jean Villapique, to improvise the story of two very different people wanting to get their cars back from an oil change. A light came on in my car. Uh -huh. it, it, they, there's a sort of a genie bottle looking thing that yeah. I, I had to look in my, my pamphlet no. to find out what it meant. Uh, that genie bottle means that you got two wishes left from the car. Along the way, they make deep discoveries about themselves, their callings in life, and magical dogs. Every Thrilling Adventure Hour fan knows just how great Hal Lovelin is at voices, especially at playing the sort of working Joes you usually associate with character actors in old movies. But rarely does he reduce these roles to mere caricature. Hal always brings a real humanity to these performances. Even if it's a surreal sort of humanity brought on by something silly like going through life without a name. We'll just need a one form of identification Perfect. and a thumbprint. Okay. Uh, well, I'm a person. <laughs> that is one form of identification. This is from Disneyland. It is, I was a driver's license from Autopia. It is blank. Number three. Episode 35, The Moon Landing Taping, 1969. A question about that elusive thing that all Americans can agree on leads to a chat with Natalie Morales about the moon landing, Donald Trump, and jury duty. You know, all the usual government conspiracies. <laughs> Young people, this is what you have to look forward to. Yeah, well, not if you're me. Not if you're you, yeah. yeah that's very strange. Scathed by without it. Then Paul joins Spontanea Nation All-Star Craig Kukowski and his Dasariski colleagues Rich Tallarico and Bob Dassey for a story very much inspired by the chat, set during Kubrick's production of The Moon Landing. So you're the guy that's gonna get us on the moon. 
Well, you know, it's gonna look like that, but it's not gonna actually be on there. The episode starts out remarkably strong as Kubrick's uncertainty about his own accent kicks off a delightful trend. Listen, I wanna apologize if I normally don't have an accent that I should have. <laughs> well, I, I, I had no idea. This is a secret project that I'm protecting my, my voice. So it's not gonna sound anything like Stanley Kubrick. Hey, it's me, Question Gregory me. Peck. I'm here to play one of the astronauts. I apologize if I have an accent I don't normally have. People don't like me. They think I'm tricky. Um, they're like, he's Tricky Dick Nixon, right? Oh, hello, Henry Kissinger here. Hey, it's me, Jack Nicholson. What oh. you want me to do here? <laughs> but the best character of the piece is the general supervising the whole production, who, despite being in charge, seems a little lost as to what's going on. Hey, and by the way, I didn't like that strange love thing. It made the, it made the people that I hang out with look like jerks. Those are my friends. Well, it's a satire, uh, General. Yeah, well, I don't like satire. I like happy tires. And I want them to be funnier. <laughs> Make them laugh. And like so many Spontaneous Nation stories, mishaps with the sound effects lead to quite a few time travel shenanigans. I'm going to give you an order, and it's a direct order. you got to do it. Yes, sir, General Tim E. Powers. You don't have to say my whole name. Just General Powers. Is, you can call me Powder Boy. Anyway. You're Timothy Edward Powers. I mean, you were first in your class at... Uh, at uh, West Point. You don't have to tell me who I am. I know what's going on. Tim E. Powers. Tim E. Powers, yes. Tim, mm? capital E, period, Powers. Right. Just think about it. For a mm. <laughs> it's a little on the nose, but listen. In the end, it turns out to be an unlikely origin story for a character you just might know. Have you ever thought about having a sort of companion travel with you? Maybe like a younger person? What, do you think I'm a pervert? No, no, it's a, you have a totally platonic relationship. <laughs> Number two, episode 49, Universal Studios Hollywood. Big surprise, I know, the theme park geek liked the episode set at Universal. Yeah, I really liked this one. Cameron Esposito is asked possibly the least personal question in the history of Spontanea Nation. How are eyeglasses made? And yet she still manages to relate it to a personal story from her childhood. I'm two years old and I wake up in the morning, one of my eyes, totally white. Totally white eye. No pupil You can't visible. see no pupil? Then Chris Tallman, Shuey Cowan, and Brandon Johnson tell the story of character actors and security detail at Universal facing a crisis as counterfeit characters roam the park. We can't have any imitators in the park. I think we right. know that. We do know the, that. The, uh, extra Jaws incident of yeah. 99. That was weird. It was a real shock. The trouble gets worse when the Universal employees are suddenly reminded that the counterfeit is of a character from their evilest competitor. All right, let me get this cocaine off this hooker and we'll be right over. Oh, what he means to say is we have to discuss it with the lawyers. Yeah! I made the nearly deadly mistake of listening to this episode on my lunch break. I could have choked to death on a salad from laughing so hard. A salad could have killed me. And my favorite episode of Spontanea Nation, episode four, Savannah, Georgia. Paul chats with the wonderful Melanie Linsky about childhood shame and embarrassment. Oh yes, it's that kind of interview. Thanks, previous guest. <laughs> <laughs> the discussion covers such topics as New Zealand's schooling system, the shape of countries, secretly being friends with popular kids outside of school, and how fortunate it is to not be saddled with the nickname Timey Downsport. Frankly, I find Melanie's backstory for Timey Kangaroo Downsport way more interesting. He's declaring to people, Timey, that's me. I'm a kangaroo. My surname is Downsport. <laughs> for whatever reason, that's what I thought. And then Spontanea Nation All-Stars Sarah Burns, Janet Varney, and Mark Evan Jackson join Paul to improvise the incredible story of what happens when three ordinary people stand around with their backs turned in Savannah, Georgia. Friends. Savannah, Georgia. It is so hot here in Savannah, Georgia. Savannah, Georgia. Will you accept my offer? To go up into space. You know it's a good sign when you have to pause a podcast just to remember how to breathe because you're laughing so hard at the reveal of a name. Or in this case, the struggle to get a name out. You know Danny? What's his name? His name is Theodore J. Tom. Theodore J. Chomp yeah. Tom Stax. What was it again? <laughs> Theodore J. Tom Stax. Tom's Jacks? Am I hearing you correctly, ma'am? Yes, we're the Savannah Tom's Jacks. Oh, yes, of course. And like so many other wonderful episodes, the story ends up spanning time, space, and dimension. Uh, Miss Tom's Jacks, now, of course, you know the seven dimensions. Of course I do. Let's trade them all, Friday. All right, now. Right, there's, there's kangaroo. There's the peanut butter one. <laughs> Not only is this a top-tier episode of this podcast, 
I dare say it's one of the most quotable pieces of media of all time. Well, the manual doesn't ever help you, but this one reads like glass. You it's know about, about your my Wednesdays. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my days of the week. And I forgot to add, ha, ha, ha. Oh, it was joking. <laughs> None of us ghosts. <laughs> ten. Oh, starting from ten. Ooh. Nine. Oh, Here boy. we go. Eight. Am I ready? I'm gonna get seven. And when can our children expect their 76 trombone, sir? I think the most troubling is that you stood up at the prom a girl named Murderbeth. And this guy, he goes like this and this and this. We're gonna make you blow up balloons until you die. You I, run out of air. But I've just been, I've just been spreading a, a gospel of love and peace, and yeah, we don't care for it. I, Mr. Debonair, Ooh, this is my daughter. We're talking daughter, about. That's his daughter. You know you it's know. not though, right? What the fuck was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> and not just the improv. Even the plugs are quotable. It, oh, happy man. for Hitler's birthday. What would you like to promote? <sighs> I mean, not Hitler, probably. Um, oh, yeah, don't. There's Mark three... Evan Jackson, summer's a coming. Oh. Summer's a coming. Don't threaten me the with boy. seasons. <gasps> Hitler sign? Yeah, yeah, a lot of Hitler. Hitler's wow. I got a lot of Hitler in my heart. <laughs> the sign of Hitler. And it all happened in a place called Spontanea Nation. So what's your favorite Spontanea Nation episode? Let's discuss it below. I could talk about this podcast forever. And if you haven't heard Spontanea Nation yet, I highly recommend not only the episodes I just listed, but really any episode. I haven't been disappointed yet. So check out Spontanea Nation on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Earwolf, Howl.fm, all the usual podcast places. And until next time, Semper in Presenti! The challenge that lays before our eyes we rise to greet a brand new morning. We fight and rise and fight and greet a new day's morn. And that is how you get to Carnegie Hall. Everybody shut up. <laughs>